Thank you, Ms. Snyder. And thank you so, so much for joining me for the SANE Crypto Podcast, the first cryptocurrency podcast for baby boomers investing for retirement. Most people believe that crypto assets are too risky for the average investor. I believe that the risk is in not investing. And in fact, cryptocurrency may be the answer to near retirees' prayers. The trick is to structure our investment so that if the naysayers are right, we don't do irreparable harm to our nest egg. But if the believers are right, we make potentially life-changing money that could catapult us across that retirement finish line. The Sane Crypto Mastermind is my signature program for those who want cryptocurrency type returns, but can't, won't, or don't have time to figure this all out and keep up with it on their own. If you would like to learn more, I'd encourage you to join my free online training, how a little, little bit of Bitcoin can make your retirement savings go a lot, lot further at sanecrypto.com forward slash retirement. What's the best strategy for investing in Bitcoin? How does it fit in an overall portfolio? How much should you invest? And should you invest in other crypto assets besides just Bitcoin? These are all really important questions that have to be answered, and they are particularly vexing when you are first getting into cryptocurrency. So that is exactly what MC Lobster and I did when he interviewed me for his top-rated Cashflow Ninja podcast. We talked about, uh, uh, we covered a lot of ground, actually. So we started with how Wall Street lost all my money, and that started my career in investing, um, and then how I got into cryptocurrency. A lot of people refer to it as falling down the proverbial rabbit hole. Um, why? The most important job of a portfolio is cash flow. My waterfall approach to asset allocation, uh, we talked about how to create a portfolio that is market agnostic. Also, cryptocurrency is a new asset class and the fundamental rules of investing and how we apply them to crypto assets because just because it is a new asset class doesn't mean that you know, we just suspend all the, the, you can't suspend the laws of, of gravity. Um, we talked about Pascal's wager, which if you've been a long time listener of this show, you've heard many, many, many times before, probably many, 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 many times in the future, uh, at least until I find a better simile for, uh, for investing in crypto assets. Uh, we talked about how much of your portfolio should be in Bitcoin. MC and I's uh, um, opinion on regulation and what that means for the future of crypto assets. We talked about why I don't invest in ICOs. And then finally, we ended on a, a bit loftier note as MC does in, I think, all of his um, podcast episodes. We talked about what three principles would I pass down to future generations to leave the world a better place. So MC has been kind enough to allow me to share that interview with my listeners as well. So without further ado, here is me being interviewed for the Cashflow Ninja podcast. Hello, Cashflow Ninjas. MC Lobster here, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today. And in today's show, I'm joined by Kim Snyder Hughes that will share how to position cryptocurrencies within your investment portfolio. Kim has spent 20 plus years as an entrepreneur, options trader, investment advisor, financial engineer, author, speaker, educator, and financial radio talk show host. Kim got into investing in the mid 1990s after having made a seven figure windfall in an IPO before the age of 30, entrusting it uh, to a well-known Wall Street brokerage firm, which proceeded to lose everything she hadn't managed to spend herself. Out of self-defense and a little bit of payback, Kim created what years later uh, came to be known as the Snyder Investment Method, a system of producing consistent cash flow from paper assets at a significantly higher rate than traditional non-engineered investments. 
Her investment firm, Snyder Advisors, which both taught and manage assets using Kim's method exclusively, was on the Inc. list of the fastest growing companies two years in a row. Kim retired at 47, sold her investment firm, and in 2011, moved to South Carolina with her husband and dogs, built a polo farm, and planned to live happily ever after. And all was going according to plan until crypto came along. Most people think cryptocurrency is uh, too risky for a run-of-the-mill portfolio. Kim believes the risk is not uh, in investing in crypto assets. Motivated by the cascade of bad advice she saw pouring out all over the internet, Kim unretired to create sane crypto and help her try and get properly positioned for what could be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but not to get wrecked if it uh, turns out to be a nothing burger. Kim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am thrilled to be here. Yeah, really excited to connect. Um, thank you for coming on. Uh, and before we dive into uh, our conversation, can you please share a little bit uh, about your background and journey with my listeners? I would love to. I'll try to keep it succinct. No one's ever accused me of being concise. <laughs> but um, So I, I think what it's, what's relevant to your listeners is I was fortunate enough coming out of college to go to work for a company that long before the age of unicorns had a pretty meteoric rise. I started as a part-time clerk in the purchasing department when the company was doing about $36 million a year in sales. Eight years later, we were over a billion dollars in sales, and I was a senior executive with the company. And uh, one of the last projects that I worked on was, along with lots of other people, by the way, was taking the company public. So before the age of 30, in the moment that our ticker symbol crossed the tape for the very first time, I suddenly had more money than you know most people would expect to make in a lifetime, and I was 28 years old. So I did the thing that seemed to make the most sense, the thing that I thought adults did, which was turn all of that money over to a broker at a brokerage firm that unless you've lived your entire life under a rock, you know the name of this firm. I proceeded to quit my job, have a really good time. And uh, two years later, they had managed to lose everything that I hadn't managed to spend. Wow. So um, I was broke in debt, um, really disillusioned, took a, a job that you know paid a fraction of the one that I had left two years earlier and vowed to myself that I would never make that mistake again, that from I would figure out this finance and investing stuff and that from that day forward, I would be responsible for whatever financial situation I found myself in. Um, so that's kind of where it started. It's a windy road from there, but what eventually came out of that was uh, I, I framed this goal of um, financial independence being the ability to do what I wanted when I wanted without having to worry about how to pay for it. And I, over a period of years, created this um, method of investing that produced cash flow at a much higher rate than you could get from bonds and other things. Um, and eventually ended up, that was just for me, you know, and, and it was funny because you typically cash flow is not something that a 30 year old thinks about. That's something that 70 year olds were thinking about, at least in terms of paper assets in the stock and bond market. Um, but I, st I uh, created it and then people started asking me what I teach them how to do it. And then their parents and Next thing you know, uh, you know, I'm doing these classes on the side that ended up becoming a, an investment firm that uh, grew into one point we had about half a billion, uh, both consulting and under management and, uh, you know, two time ink list. And um, uh, yeah, so I retired in 2009 at the age of 47, moved to South Carolina thinking I was going to live happily ever after and always going according to plan until crypto came along. How did you uh, get into crypto? 
<laughs> well, funny, a friend of mine, a very good friend here in, in Aiken, just mentioned to me one day that she had inherited like $300,000 worth of cryptocurrency. And t- to be honest, MC, like I, you know, I, when I retired, I retired, I was out of gas. Like I had rolled over one day, looked at my husband and said, I'm like, I'm done. I'm, you know, and, and I really hadn't thought about investing or kept up with it for all, all these years. And, but when she said that she had inherited $300,000, like my first response, my knee jerk response was to scream at her. Oh my God, get rid of that. Are you kidding me? Like that must be a scam. It's, and uh, fortunately I didn't. And uh, over a period of time, she kept asking me about it. And every time she'd asked me about it, it was worth more versus it was worth 600,000 and then like 1.2 million. And I was like, okay, wait a second. So uh, that was really how I got in is she caused me to to want to understand, first of all, was it real? And then, you know, second of all, once I determined that, how would it fit in my portfolio? And then she convinced me that this is what I did best and that I should be helping people with it. So that's how I got in. Very, very interesting. Now, uh, before we dive into more on the on the crypto, uh, you'd mention mention cash flow investing, and of course, here at the Cash Flow Ninja, we are massive, massive proponents of cash flow and investing for cash flow. What were some of the other? Um, if you if you take a philosophical approach to wealth building, what are some of the things that you look at? Um, and then also, uh, is there a checklist that you draw from? Uh, and then you based uh, investment decisions on? Yes. So uh, for me, uh, the way I think about this a little bit differently, I think, than most people. Um, For me, portfolio construction is what I call a waterfall approach. And meaning we start with the one job that our portfolio has to do, which is the Job number one, the most important, and in my world, as in yours, that is to produce enough cash flow for me to be able to, as I said earlier, do what I want, when I want, without having to worry about how I'm going to pay for it for the rest of my life. That is job one. I can't eat capital appreciation, right? The only thing that will that will accomplish that goal for me is the ability to generate sufficient cash flow from my portfolio. And so if that's job one, then as when I'm starting out investing, what I do is I only accumulate cash flow um, assets up until I have accomplished that goal. And then and only then do I look at putting something else in my portfolio. Right. And so then for me, right. And, and like, depending on what your number is, you've got to start with the end in mind, of course. Uh, but, you know, once you get to that point, then I start to the second piece of my waterfall is the next pool. I call it is commodities. And the reason for the commodities is that I believe the next biggest threat is hyperinflation. And of course, commodities do a great job of hedging against that hyperinflation goal, whether you're talking about gold, you know, meats, metals, grains, etc. cetera. Um, that's the, the very definition of inflation is that those base level goods go up in price. And then once I have accumulated enough of those that I feel like I have that hedge taken care of, my third pool and final pool is... Uh, alternative investments to hedge against market risk. Market risk being the market's ups and downs, right? The fact that the time when I might need to, um, uh, you know, withdraw from my portfolio may not be the best time. And interestingly, I think most people worry about market risk first. I worry about that last. If, if, there's a problem that I have to solve for in my portfolio. That's going to be the last one because I I know that the cash flow, um, if I've structured it properly so that it doesn't fluctuate meaningfully in up and down markets, then I don't have to worry about market risk the same way that other people do. And uh, so I construct a portfolio. I've always done it that way. And then now cryptocurrency, you know, has to fit 
kind of within that overall portfolio construction? You mentioned a couple of things, and, and from a big picture perspective, too, it's, it's interesting how you structure all of this. Um, and uh, that made me just think of what are you currently seeing out there in the global economy and markets? Because, you know, crypto and, and Bitcoin specifically came out of this, this last financial crisis, right, of, uh, of 2008. And in 2009, there was a white paper by an individual uh, called Satoshi Nakamoto or a group. Um, but uh, w- what are you currently seeing out there and how does this play into uh, the crypto play? Mm-hmm. Well, w- one of the interesting things about the way I approach investing is I try to always be market agnostic, meaning I don't, I, fundamentally, I don't believe that I or anyone else has a crystal ball and can accurately predict the future. We can all guess, but we really can't know. And uh, you know, if you look and and study the prediction market, uh, you know, the people who get paid millions and billions of dollars to uh, offer us their advice and predictions, their track record is actually pretty horrible. So, uh, and I certainly don't think I'm smarter than them. So, what's uh, for me, fundamental is this idea of creating a portfolio that does well regardless of what happens in the market. Um, you know, we came through 2008, 2009, um, you know, just fine. And because of that construction, did I predict that it was coming? Did I trade into that, you know, by shorting the market or anything like that? Nope. I didn't make one single change to our portfolio um, any different than it had been for the last 10 or 15 years, nor do I change it in order to, you know, account for the bull market that we've been in for the last, uh, since the crisis, right? That's very central to my way of investing because I just don't believe I'm, I'm smart enough uh, to do that. So I try, I tr- when I say that I'm agnostic, I really try to be neither bull nor, nor bear and be an owl. Um, so, you know, that said, you know, I, ca- I can't help but have an opinion, but I, I you know, I try not to let it affect the way that I create my portfolio. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and that kind of ties into my next question, because one of the things that what I like about what, uh, what you've shared is that um, the crypto clause is an asset clause. It's still an investment clause and the basic rules and the approaches still apply. Um, I think uh, we've seen a, a lot of emotion uh, drive or enter the market. I don't know uh, how much is is still left in it. Where folks kind of lost the plot with uh, mortgaging houses and <laughs> getting super excited about this, but kind of losing sight that this is just another vehicle still, and uh, not not a magic bullet or something that uh, you know is uh, the, the get rich quick uh, uh, a vehicle of choice. It- Absolutely. I'm in total agreement with you. And um, I think maybe that is partially because this was first embraced by the younger millennial generation who were so disaffected by, you know, the after the financial crisis, um, although certainly everybody was affected. But, you know, and they just don't have the experience with investing, you know, I mean, look, we've all, you know, I did it, right? I I mean, I I invested, I was an options trader during the the internet bubble, you know, and so we all kind of have to have our bubble to learn, (laughs) learn the lesson. Uh, But it does kind of make you shake your head. And, and it's really important to understand, yes, that this just, yes, it's exciting. It's a new asset class. It has the most interesting asymmetric, upside downside skew that we've we will probably see in our lifetime which is what makes it so compelling but you can't lose sight of the fact that that also you know can potentially wreck you if you get too overly exuberant you know uh, the laws of gravity do still apply and you've got to be smart about how you put this into an overall investment plan 
Yeah, it's still a risk and a reward trade-off, uh, as you've uh, alluded to. Um, what are some of the strategies that you would share uh, of how to manage it and how to utilize some of the basic fundamental rules of invest- investing sure. to position yourself for success? Yeah. I mean, well, you know, let's just be clear what we're talking about when we say fundamental uh, rules of investing. Uh, you, you know, I mean, these, these are things like you you – the way that you construct a portfolio is you have to start with the end in mind. For example, you're not just trying to blindly accumulate money. There's a purpose for that money and, a, and some amount that you need to, uh, uh, to accumulate in order to serve particular functions for you. Your money has a job, right? What's that money's higher job? You know, markets are mean reverting, meaning they don't grow to the sky. Uh, you can't look at just the return. You've got to look at risk-adjusted return. There's no free lunch. You, you know, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. All those things don't go away just because we're talking about this new asset class. So in terms of of the the strategies, you know, I the way again and in, in, in keeping with my general theme of trying to be okay no matter what happens, because while really deep down, if you put a gun to my head and you ask me, am I bullish about cryptocurrency? I am. I I, I you know I wouldn't have come out of retirement if I didn't think that there was much more upside than than downside. But being an owl, I just I have to play the game to say it could go to zero just as, you know, 50-50, flip a, flip a coin, it could go to zero as much as it could go to a million. And so how do you construct a portfolio accordingly? And for me, um, the way that I think about that is not through, uh, well, it's really through game theory um, to begin with. Like the, uh, I know you've had, I think you had Annie Duke on your show, right? Um no, um, I haven't had him on my show. Oh, okay. So y- the idea for me is um, I call it, it's Pascal's wager. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard of Pascal's wager, but you know Pascal, Blaise Pascal was a, a 16th century mathematician and, and philosopher, and he and Pascal's wager was um, he he was talking about uh, a bet about whether God exists or doesn't right? Which is kind of funny. But um, what he said was, that, like, the gist of the wager was, you know, that you can't know whether God exists through just reason, right? So the, the wise thing for you to do is to live as though he does, right? Because you have everything to gain and nothing to lose, right? If, if he does, then you've gained and you're right, you know, you've gained heaven. And if he doesn't, then you've lost nothing. But if you, if you know, if you, uh, if you, if you say that he doesn't, and he really does, then you're screwed because you've got a life in hell and punishment and all that, right? So that's yeah. called Pascal's wager: the idea that um, you can't know what's going to happen, but you, ha- but you have to act as if God exists. In this case, you know, I think we can all agree, God and religion aside, that, you know, Bitcoin going to a million dollars, that'd be the financial equivalent of, of heaven, you know, and being 90 years old, broke, living under a bridge, eating cat food, that'd be the financial equivalent of hell. So you have to assume that, you know, Bitcoin is going to, or c- cryptocurrency is going to, uh, to do well, and, but construct the portfolio such that it will you, you won't get wrecked if it doesn't, right? That's the, the central thing. And so going back to uh, the in- ba- basics of investment, okay, well, one of the ways that we do that, one of the key things in all investments is, co- is position sizing. If, for example, you put too much into a, if you're a trader, a position, or as an investor into an, an allocation, that's, that is going to be a key determinant of that risk-reward profile and what outcome you're going to have. So for me, right, and I go probably against what a lot of people would tell you, but I do not believe you should have more than 2% of your total investable assets in cryptocurrency. And for me, I also believe, by the way, that it should be in uh, predominantly in Bitcoin and, and not all these altcoins. Uh, that's a different discussion. But 2%, because, because look, here's what happens. Let's just say we're right. You know, it, and let's just say we 
put in, uh, in you've got a $500,000 portfolio, you put $10,000, that's 2%. In, in a $500,000, going back to our cash flow, a $500,000 portfolio can generate at a 4% withdrawal rate, if you, if you, agree, you, know, if you, if you accept that, that's $20,000 a year. Okay, if you lose that entire $10,000 because Bitcoin goes to zero, the income potential of your portfolio, which is the only thing I care about, goes down to $19,600. So basically, the impact is almost nothing. On the other hand, if you got the returns that we got just last year, no guarantees that we will, but right? Or that we will again next year. But, you know, those were 1,044% for 2017. That $10,000 would have turned into 127000 That would have been your return on a $10,000 investment. That's what we mean by Pascal's wager. That's what we mean by an asymmetric upside downside skew. Because what that does, that turns that portfolio income potential for me, which is what I care about, into... 25,000 a year. So instead of 20,000, 25,000, that's a that's a $5,000 raise for life. That's meaningful. That's 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 25%. That's massive. That's why you have to be in, but it's also why you have to be very 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 conservative on the position sizing or the asset allocation. Does that make sense? Yeah, that absolutely does. And, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, you touched on ICOs. Now, you've mentioned Bitcoin and then, I mean, there's a trove of other ones. Before we just jump into that, uh, regulations are coming in. What, are, what is your opinion on the regulations that's coming in? Are you seeing that as a positive sign as well? I do. I, I, I guess I'm an old fogey. Even though I, I feel like politically I'm fairly libertarian, I, I think there is a place for regulation that isn't heavy handed. And in our case, I think it's nothing but positive for cryptocurrency because I think then now here's me not being an owl, right? (laughs) Here's my, my bullishness seeping through, but in order to get that next big jump up in the future of cryptocurrency, we need institutional money to come into the space, right? We need right. both the credibility that comes from it, but we just need the money because it, uh, you know, it just dwarfs the current network value that, of, of, you know, we have, there are hedge funds that manage more than the current mark network value of, of uh, cryptocurrency, right? So right. that is so important and that can't happen unless two things occur. One is that we get some clarity on the regulatory side. Uh, and two is that there's some infrastructure created that will allow, you know, the pensions and sovereign wealth funds and endowments and some of those people who have fiduciary responsibilities to legally enter the space. Because right now they're sitting on the sidelines chomping at the bits a bit and they can't uh, and, and nor should they until some of this gets cleared up. So, yeah, I think it's a good thing. I welcome it. Yeah, that is that is uh, what I think as well, and what a lot of insiders in the community and people that are involved in crypto was thinking as well. You see people freaking out in the in the marketplace, but if you look at some of the the regulatory stuff coming in, it legitimizes it a lot because it's you know now now the, these folks are looking at it as a legitimate asset class, um, and also it's going to weed out a lot of the frauds that they that they have to have to be just on the the law of averages and the ICOs, uh, all of these different coins, and then as you mentioned, um, that the institutional money uh, will then also come into because imagine if you're if you're a, a, an employee or a trader going to your boss at a huge institution and saying, I've got this great idea. Well, there's not a lot of regulatory. Uh, the market cap is, you know, is, is under a trillion. Uh, but this is going to be great. I, I can promise you, you know, this is the future. Well, right. and that person's going to be without a job very, very quickly. Absolutely. Uh, it's so true. And, and, you know, in the, look, we want to be, I don't know about you, but I actually like volatility. Uh, vol- uh, I make money on volatility and which is really difficult for the, the typical retail investor because that tends to make their fear and greed rear up and 
they buy at tops and sell at bottoms, you know, which is kind of my edge is that ability to, to, to manage that. Um, but as this money comes in, so we want to be positioned ahead of that institutional money. But that's the other thing, too, is as that money comes in, it's, gosh, you know, some of this volatility will go away. There's just, there's so much to be gained from that institutional money and credibility that, um, yeah, any downside that comes from, from regulation, you know, it just pales in comparison to the upside potential as a result. You'd mentioned ICOs, now these initial coin offerings. Um, what are you? You don't. You're not a big fan of them. Can you share why you don't uh, invest in them and why you don't like them? Sure. I wrote a blog post about this just very, very recently called What is an ICO and Why Don't You Invest in Them? Which if anybody's interested, they can find it sanecrypto.com forward slash ICO. Um, but so there's a couple things. Um, uh, okay. Fundamentally, right? An ICO is backward fundraising. <laughs> you know, meaning that unlike the traditional IPO process where someone has to take an idea, slog their guts out for 10 years to prove product market fit and, and produce revenue and profits and go through all of the seed rounds. And, you know, as I said to you, the last project that I worked on um, at that company was taking it public. That was a, for us, that was a three-year process. And oh, by the way, it was the second time we tried because the first time the market fell out from under us, right? So we had spent millions of dollars and years of manpower and labor, right, to get public um, with underwriters looking in every single crack and, and cranny. And there's a reason, that's, that's good, <laughs> actually, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I, I think it was Clay Collins of, of Nomics who said, you know, hey, give someone $4 billion with, on the basis of a, of a white paper with no ownership and no accountability. What could possibly go wrong with that? So fundamentally, I have a problem with ICOs in general, right? But moreover, even if, let's just, let's just take that out of the equation for a moment. Um, I, and and assume that all of them were legit and they had the best of intentions and, and so forth. There's still three big problems. One is, is regulatory risk. The second is what I call wrong wave. And the third is the velocity problem. So the regulatory risk, we yeah, I think we've already talked about. Most people understand the here in the United States, at least the SEC and the CFTC have been pretty clear that uh, ICOs are, they view them as unregulated securities. And there's a big cloud of uncertainty as to, you know, what if anything they're going to do retroactively um, and how that's going to affect the future viability of anything that was brought to market uh, at, as an ICO. Okay. So there's that. Um, but then there's, there's two other problems. One is um, when I say wrong wave, what I'm referring to is Steve Case's book, The Third Wave. If you don't, if you're not familiar with Steve Case, the name, he was the founder of AOL. And he wrote this, he wrote a really good book that I think is uh, a great roadmap for how we sh should expect cryptocurrency to play out, similar using the internet as, as a uh, backdrop. The, he says that the first wave was basically the creation of, uh, you know, all of the infrastructure that underlies the internet. So th that was the Cisco's and the, the three comms and the, you know, the fiber optic that was laid level three laying fiber optic everywhere, right? Those were the companies that um, were viable during the first wave. They're also the ones that even though, they were successful um, and maybe even profitable during that time were terrible investments when the crash came. And if you believe like I do that 99% of these will fail, just like they did in the internet bubble, right? And that we can't pick which ones, um, then, you know, you really don't want to be invested in the first wave 
beyond um, you know beyond the technology, the, the protocol itself, which is to me Bitcoin. Um, but and so you know if you look at the, a lot of these projects that I see too. Their second wave, and the second wave are the companies that came after. Those were the the Facebooks and the Amazons and the you know all the companies that got built on top of the internet. Um, our second wave. Well, so when you look at a lot of these projects, you think, yeah, those make a lot of sense, but not now. You know, we're still trying to build out the underlying protocols, and you're talking about building a decentralized Uber. It's the wrong wave, just like Pets.com or, you know, Chewy, you know, it, it's the same thing as Chewy. Um, Chewy got bought by somebody here for, you know, billions of dollars while Pets.com failed because it was the wrong wave. So I just think, you know, there's, a, there's uh, the headwinds against all of these projects um, in that regard are massive. And then finally, there's this velocity problem. Um, and the velocity problem, uh, in a nutshell, says that for most of these projects, the more successful will they become, um, the more they're used, the closer their price will be to zero. And that is based on a, uh, a formula. Um, I don't know if you've read any of Chris Bernisky's work, um, but there's it's something, uh, basically the price, the valuation of a, of a crypto asset um, is you find it through the exchange formula, which is M equals PQ divided by V, right? And V be, being velocity, well, this is why they call it the velocity problem. Basically, the more a coin, the more a currency turns over, um, the more it drives the price, which is, you know, the uh, M down to zero. So, uh, and um, that's really nerdy and geeky, but it's the sort of thing when I say like the rules of investing still apply. That's how you value a crypto asset. It's not the, you know, it's, it's not the cash flow, discounted cash flow model that we have for stocks, but there still is a valuation and the price has to approximate that valuation. And all of these people who are kind of pouring in without regard to how you value one of these things and the fact that all of these uh, ICOs, I think, even if they're successful, should go towards zero won't be investable assets and people are just ignoring that so yeah those are those are the reasons why i don't like icos uh your outlook for bitcoin and crypto in general for the rest of 2019 uh i try not to have an opinion but again put a gun to my head and i'm i'm a bull <laughs> perfect now, uh, Kim, one habit I've observed from wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skill sets. What uh, new subjects are you currently studying and what new skill sets are you currently learning? Ah, that is, that's an interesting question. Um, my, well, I think my biggest investment right now in terms of learning is clearly the digital marketing side of my business. Okay. Uh, that's where I'm investing most of my time right now uh, outside of investments. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a digital world and a great uh, way to get your message across and some of the great information uh, that you put out. And by uh, the way, you are great at it. It's so <laughs> impressive what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a core message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. So if you cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Hmm. You know, so I wouldn't want to... Uh, I guess I would caveat this by, by saying, of course, this is what has worked for me. Uh, you know, uh, I've created a, a life, a, a really good life by, you know, living these three principles doesn't necessarily mean that I would prescribe them for, for someone else, but they, they are this. Um, the first one, I, I think I mentioned when I was telling you kind of my background, and it's that you alone are responsible for whatever financial situation you find yourself in specifically, but, but more generally, what, 
whatever general situation you find yourself in. Nobody else, not your, not the government, not your mother, not your father, not the way you were raised, not your boyfriend, your husband, your CPA, you, right? Only you. Um, I think the second one is one of the most impactful sayings uh, in my life has been um, one day I, years ago, I heard Zig Ziglar speak and at exactly the right moment in time, as, as often happens, I heard him say his now famous phrase, you know, you can have everything you want in life if you'll just help everyone else get what they want. And I have tried my hardest to follow that ever since. And it sounds trite, but everything in my life sort of that had just been crap before that all started going in the right direction from that point forward. And I believe it's because of trying to live life that way. Um, and the third thing, uh, which I kind of referred to tangentially, is the one thing. Um, and following the one thing. If you're not familiar with the one thing, it's a book by Gary Keller, founder of Keller Williams Real Estate. And I would say this is probably the second most impactful thing behind Zig Ziglar. Uh, for me, kind of the basic clarifying question in the one thing is what's the one thing? If you could only do one, that by doing it now would make everything else easier and unnecessary. And so my waterfall approach, for example, is kind of the the investment embodiment of the one thing, you know, um, working on cash flow, then working on uh, and hedging inflation, then working on hedging market risk. It's, it's the, what this really is about is about leverage. Um, as an individual, the only thing that we really have at the end of the day is our time and what we spend our time on. And by being um, really intentional and thoughtful about spending that time where we get the most leverage, we can amplify the results that we want to achieve in life many times over. And so those would be my three. All right, hopefully that was helpful. If so, you could do me a great, great big favor in return, which is number one, to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And number two, to leave me a five-star rating and review with comments and feedback. Um, this feeds the great iTunes algorithm gods. We all understand algorithms these days. The more engagement I have with the show, the more comments and ratings and subscribes we get, the more people iTunes will show it to. If you don't get those things, then iTunes will just put it into a big black dark hole. And for those of you who have been leaving those ratings and reviews, I appreciate you so, so much. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about investing in crypto assets for retirement, my system for doing that, I recommend my free online training, which is how a little, little bit of Bitcoin can make your retirement savings go a lot, lot further at sanecrypto.com forward slash retirement. You can get the full show notes of this episode at sanecrypto.com forward slash podcast, including links to MC's podcast, uh, as well as links to articles and resources about the best strategy for investing in Bitcoin, in case you want to do a deeper dive on any of that, which I encourage. And finally, if you have a question about today's topic or anything else, really, just email me at askkim at sanecrypto.com. I read and answer every single email personally, as well as answer some of them here on the show. Everything I say on this show is for educational purposes only. Nothing should be considered investment advice. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All investments involve risk. So do not, under any circumstances, invest money you can't afford to lose. That is it for me. I am Kim Snyder. I will be back next week. Until then, may the crypto gods continue to smile on us all.